species covered for future generations of district residents. Great to see the variety of wildlife things in DC and the great photos too. All the, you know, not just birds, but other things too. You just have to remember that there are other animals as well as birds. <laughs> Sometimes I acknowledge that. So. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce Dave Wilson. Um, with, uh, he is uh, with Audubon, Maryland, DC, uh, consulting with us uh, on our IBA Champions um, initiative. And he's going to talk on comprehensive zoning of planning. In a way, uh, the next two talks are linked. We're getting into uh, the idea here of land use advocacy. And um, so we're going to be looking at, first of all, the planning system. And then uh, Kim Gordon Grant with 1,000 Friends of Maryland will be talking about how you can influence that planning system. Okay, so these two, these two presentations go together. Um, it's up there. Uh, here, Keith. Keith. Okay, then take it away, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I know we're approaching 2.30, we're probably going to be in a food coma here shortly, but, uh, and I know planning and zoning has never put anyone in a coma. Um, <laughs> but I do want to, this is something that really is, is uh, really important to me. I, you know, I've lived in Worcester County for the past 21 years. And spent the last 18 years fighting really hard for what is the best zoning in the state. Uh, not just me, but a whole team of folks have done that. And I want to talk a little bit about today. A little bit about just sort of the basics of planning. And Kim's going to follow me up with some really good information on how to really get involved in planning. I think a lot of times we get stuck on national elections and stuff and, and you think about those and how important they are very important for wildlife and water quality but planning and zoning is probably the most important thing that you can learn about you really want to protect wildlife habitat um, and the best way to do it is to really get involved early on in planning and zoning process so i just want to briefly So, uh, what, what are planning and zoning, what are zoning plans and what are comp plans and what do they do? Well, one of the things they do is they determine where development occurs, they determine the type of development that you have, where that development occurs, or if you don't have development. And again, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, I know a lot of, there's really good folks with planning and zoning uh, knowledge here, um, but I'll, so I try, I'll try not to do that as I, I go through this. And then what the development looks like. And I want to say this over and over again during this presentation, you do not have to accept the lowest common denominator. Whatever you zone for is what you're going to get. Whatever you plan for is what you're going to get. You do not have to plan for Walmarts and strip malls and, and quarter acre subdivisions over the, the countryside. You do not have to do that. There's nothing in any law that says you need to do that. And so keep that in mind as we kind of go through this. Oops. So again, Zoning and planning and zoning, I'm going to continue to stress, it's really the most important factor when it comes to wildlife and water quality. And so what can comprehensive plans do? I know when we redid our plan in Worcester County, we zoned pretty much all the new growth outside of floodplains, outside of forest land, outside of wetlands. Uh, and you can also do that with IBAs. This is a map of IBAs in Maryland. You could zone for no growth or very little growth inside of those areas if and when you redo your comp plans. So what are some, what do comp plans look like and what are some <coughs> of the zoning categories? I want to go through these. Uh, this is your typical, this is actually from Ventura County, California. You could have taken this from anywhere. Um, you have usually open space or ag zone, which is your strictest zone where you really want to have ag and forest land. Then you have the whole gamut after that from high density uh, residential, low density, you have industrial, which is sometimes hard to get developed, especially in the Eastern Shore. Um, you have uh, lots of different commercial zones in which you can allow for things like Walmart or mom and pop stores. It all depends on how you do it, how big the parcels are, and where that zoning is. So I want to stress today the ag zone because that's where the conservation really takes place. And when within those zones that you saw there, there's a lot of really important language that shows or says what can be inside of those zoning categories. 
things. And so in most counties, all of these things would be allowed in the ag zone. Uh, we, did, we redid our Worcester County plan. We took almost all of these, except the chicken houses, out of the ag zone. And so you can have campgrounds in ag zones, which are glorified subdivisions in many cases. Uh, you can have golf courses in ag zones, which most people know are really not good for wildlife. Uh, you can have fracking in most ag zones. Um, and of course, CAFOs are a huge problem on the eastern shore now. The, the amount of CAFOs coming up is preposterous. Uh, and so if you've seen, I think there's, excuse me? Uh, the, the confined animal feeding operations are the chicken houses on the eastern shore. So the chicken houses are coming up in forest land and zone, in areas that wouldn't even normally be developable. And so you have what is really another sort of development in this land, which again, is really not good for wildlife, not to mention water quality. Another thing that good ag zoning does, and I'll talk about the different kinds of ag zoning in a second, um, is help you preserve land. And this is a, a map of Worcester County where um, I live. I'm, not, I'm actually from Pennsylvania originally. But uh, everything you see in color here is protected land. And the reason that 30% of Worcester County is protected is because we have really good zoning. And so people aren't hedging their bets, saying, well, it might be developable someday, or you know, think that they're going to get more lots than they're going to get. The ag zone in Worcester County, you get five lots on <coughs> the entire county, which is about 88% of Worcester County is ag zone. You have Ocean City up there, right? Um, Berlin, right, right up here in the middle. Most of this is all ag zone, except for Snow Hill and Pocomoke. And you get five lots, just regardless of your parcel size in the ag zone, after 1967. So if on 1968 I have a 1,000-acre parcel and I took off one lot, I have four lots left. That's it. Uh, that's really good ag zoning and something we'd love to see in other parts of Maryland. And this is something to accomplish. So this is a really, this is the fun part. And thanks to Bonnie and Jim and Bob and, and Kim who are here. Just some really great work being done in Charles County. And God knows it needs it because I want, I want to kind of go back and forth a little bit with this. Sorry to flip Charles County. I really wanted to be able to see it. But if you look at the ag zone, most of what looks like Worcester County, Charles County actually has twice the number of people as Worcester County, but has, um, I think, uh, how many more times the, yeah, so Worcester, Charles County has twice the number of residential units, but 12 times the amount of developed land. It's, and it's because of how Charles County has developed. And so if you look at these maps, and this is the proposed plan for Charles County, pretty much all this ag zone, everything you see in green here in Worcester County, is about one lot, it comes out to about one lot for, for 25 acres. Uh, in Charles County, the best, the closest they are to that is one lot per 10 acres, and that is this little blue area here. The rest of this is one in three, this is higher density, and so you can see what the results of that will be if that plan is, is comes through. And there's other counties that are similar to this. Frederick County has issues, uh, even our neighboring counties on the shore have issues with this. And so if you look at kind of the results of this, when we redid the comp plan in Worcester County, for example, we estimated about a 5.3% annual growth rate, and we figured over the next 20 years we needed to upzone about 3,800 acres. In Charles County, they're looking at less than, I think their plan looks less than 20 years ahead, they're looking to add 27,000 acres of, of new growth in the county to accommodate a 2% annual growth rate. And so, again, Getting involved in these things early on is really important because what happens is a lot of times we'll see a big subdivision, we'll say, oh, we don't want that, it's terrible, but if the zoning's already there, it's really difficult to fight. So you need to fight these battles early on. Of course, there's information down here at the bottom about really how good um, zoning can actually affect your tax rate as well. Worcester County has some of the lowest income taxes in Maryland, has some of the lowest property taxes as well. That's cause, really because of the zoning. Uh, another thing that I was lucky enough to do was I, I chaired this group um, in around two th early 2006 or 7, where we looked at the surrounding counties from Worcester on the shore. So we looked at Worcester County and the two counties in Maryland, which were Accomack and Northampton counties. Virginia. And Virginia, yeah. And then we looked at Sussex County in Delaware. And so we did a build-out scenario and said, well, if we build out everything, when everything's built out based on the zoning, what we think the zoning will be once we take out protected lands and wetlands, how many households will we have in these counties? And so this is a good, I gives you an idea of what bad ag zoning does. 
you think of five lots per parcel in Worcester County, will give you about 79,000 acres when it's built out. But in Sussex County, Delaware, their ag zoning is two lots per, per acre. And so at two lots per acre in a 600,000 acre county, it's a little bit bigger than Worcester, this is what you get, 1.1 million units when Sussex County, Delaware is built out. And if you've driven through Sussex County, you can kind of see that happening. It's a hideous mess. I don't know why. Sorry if you live in Sussex County. <laughs> um, but that's what's happening right now in Sussex County is that really poor action is really hurting it. So just to kind of wrap up, what, what do good comp plans do? They maintain, they maintain the agricultural and rural nature of the county. They're updated now about every 10 years. Uh, we do have a tier mapping system, which, which actually a good buddy of mine, Rich Hall, actually got in place with the Maryland legislature, which the current administration is not enforcing. So that could be an issue. So keep your eyes on that if you live in any county in Maryland. Um, Comp plans also increase the amount of open space. I talked about that and how that works when you have good zoning. Um, they protect sensitive habitats. Again, you can zone outside of important habitats and the habitats you want based on how you, what your comp plan looks like. But you reduce the threat of development to cultural and natural resources. Uh, this was, again, it's a great example of a, a farm that was, this is a thousand acre farm in Worcester County that was unfortunately zoned for residential in the 1980s. And that 600 acre, 120 year old piece of woods became a 650 lot subdivision. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of thing that happens sometimes. Again, just basic <laughs> concepts, lear learning basic concepts, which Kim may talk about in, in zoning, what is sprawl zoning, what is not sprawl zoning, don't be afraid of high density and mixed use. Those are actually good things. They help keep people from sprawling over the countryside. Encouraging infill. Towns like Berlin are really great towns in the Eastern Shore because they don't have a bunch of crap outside of them because you have Berlin and then outside of Berlin you have farmland. Uh, and so that makes Berlin really vibrant uh, and has a lot of great energy and young people and it's a town people want to visit because they can get to it and it's authentic. It doesn't look like anywhere USA. And of course the tax burden as I mentioned, when you have sprawling uh, zoning, you have a lot more traffic, you have a lot more police and fire needs, you have a lot more school needs, uh, and this is a huge burden on the tax on the taxpayers. So again, as you look at this, Worcester County on the left, Western, a certain place in Western Maryland on the right, um, your county again decides the lowest common denominator. So keep that in mind when you're when you're going. When, as you hear Kim Goldenbrandt talk, and Kim's been wonderful to work with, by the way. Sorry, I'm working for the last year. Um, and in addition to Bonnie and Jim, uh, keep in mind that you don't have to accept junk. You, you the one people call the shots, and what they decide is going to be zoned on the land is what's going to be zoned. So I want to hand it over to Kim now. Yeah. So, thank you. Thanks to Dave Kirsten too, his leadership has really gotten us into the stuff. We're really great to see Audubon.